Good morning, I'm Kim Malley, the Senior Retail Insight Manager here at AHGB and welcome to the second of our 2021 webinars by the Retail and Consumer Insight team. If you're new to what our team do, we're here to provide independent, impartial market analysis and insights to support levy payers and others in the industry to better understand their market and therefore make more informed business decisions. We do this through regular reporting on our website, through meetings, conferences, webinars like this, and looking at retail and food service consumption trends and tracking consumer attitudes and behaviours. Today's webinar is focusing on the changing market landscape for dairy as we start to get back to some sort of normality following the, the pandemic. The team will be taking you through how dairy purchasing and consumption has evolved and more importantly what the opportunities and threats are for the category. Um, as mentioned, this is our second webinar and I'll touch on um, the third one that's available that will be held in a few weeks at the end, but first some housekeeping points. We will aim to finish before the hour with the agenda being 45 minutes from us and then about 10 minutes for Q&A at the end. All participants will be on mute throughout, but questions can be asked by typing them in the questions box, which you should be able to see on the right hand side. If you can't see, um, there might be a little orange arrow to expand your taskbar and then there's a white arrow to open the question box where you should be able to type them in. Um, the session is being recorded and therefore will be hosted on our website afterwards in case you want to play it back or pass on the recording to anyone else. Um, the presentation slides will be available for all participants after the session if you complete a quick two minute feedback um, form that will pop up at the right at the end. Um, so it's really important that you fill this in for us. Um, and lastly, if you're on social media platforms, please feel free to post about this session and make sure you tag us at AHU, hashtag AHUB Insight um, as, seen on, um, as seen on the slide. Um, so this would be a good point to introduce our speakers for today. So we have Grace Vandal, who is the Retail Insight Manager in the team, and Susie Stannard, who is the Consumer Insight Manager. They're going to be a bit of a double act and we'll spend about 40 to 45 minutes taking you through how the dairy market is looking. Then this will lead nicely into the Q&A session, which I will host at the end. So don't forget to input your questions during the session. So without further ado, I'll hand over to um, Grace Vandal. Thanks, Kim. Um, we're going to start with the key consumer behaviours and how they are impacting dairy. So if we just move to the next slide. In-home consumption is still elevated above 2019 levels. So on this chart, we see the number of meals eaten in home shown on the blue line on the top and the out of home meals on the red line at the bottom. When COVID hit, you can see the dramatic change that happened um, with uh, eating in home uh, being uh, elevated. Um, and with the out of home market being restricted. Um, but we can also see how they have started to recover since then. In the latest September data period, um, there were 5.7 billion in home consumption occasions, which is half a billion higher than we've seen on the pre pandemic average. This is linked to the reduction in the eating out market, as there were 1.8 billion out of home occasions, down from the pre pandemic average of 2.1. We have seen out of home recover since restrictions have eased, but this recovery has slowed in the last few months. We have also seen started to see a recovery for lunch boxes as we return to work and the kids go back to school. If we now look at how this has impacted dairy, on the chart we see the year on year change of volumes over time. And on the green line, we see total dairy and the blue line, we see uh, total grocery. So we've seen the huge growth in volumes from March 2020. But for dairy, this was slower than total grocery. Dairy was heavily consumed before the pandemic. Um, and over the last year, um, in home, 99.7% of households bought a cow dairy product in the last year. And the average person bought dairy more than 100 times. So this level of growth is still pretty impressive. Since May 2021, we have seen both dairy and total grocery fall into decline as we start to compare back to the first lockdown. In the 12 weeks ending the 5th of September 2021, total dairy was down 2.9% in terms of volumes. 
but volumes are still up 5.8% on 2019 levels. So we are seeing the impact of the pandemic boosting sales still, and all dairy categories remain up on 2019. The retail channels that we use have also been impacted by this pandemic. The top numbers in the green box are the volume performance for the 52 weeks ending February 2020, 2020 so pre-COVID. And there we can see that um, pre-pandemic, the big four and milkmen were in decline, where we see saw growth for online and discounters. In the navy boxes in the middle is the performance over the last 52 weeks uh, to the 5th of September. So over the last year, all channels have seen really strong growth. Online was the fastest growing, up 46.5% and also contributed the most to volume growth. If we look at the last 12 weeks, as we annualise, we see that all channels struggled to grow on those heights of 2020. However, doorstep has seen the least decline, only down 0.2%, which shows they really managed to retain some of those new shoppers that they gained over lockdown. And it demonstrates also that consumers really value the convenience of having milk delivered. Therefore, reminding consumers of how convenient milkmen or online deliveries are will keep a lot of shoppers engaged. But it is also worth considering a health or environmental message to justify the price premium of delivered milk. Since the pandemic, many consumers felt the economic pinch, with 28% of people claiming that their household finances have been negatively impacted. However, 16% say that they are better off than they were before the pandemic. In our consumer tracker from August, the top three things consumers are looking to do to save money are buy products on promotion, switch from branded to own label, and to shop at cheaper stores. This is very similar to how shoppers actually behaved during the 2008 recession, where buying more on promotion and trading down were the main ways that people combated price increases. So there is an opportunity here to play up dairy's credentials as a low cost, versatile, and highly nutritious food. If we now look at trends in the food service market, um, it's very hard to get specific data on dairy and food service, but we can look at a total market level and also um, look at certain meals and foods, um, which we can pull out throughout the presentation. Looking at the food service market, on the go was the largest in terms of meal occasions before the pandemic. This was followed by uh, dining in and then takeaway. But since the pandemic, we've seen a huge growth in takeaways, up 85% year on year, and 164% on 2019. Despite this huge, the huge rise in delivery services such as Deliveroo and Uber Eats, drive through and collections are still the most popular for takeaways. We have seen a positive recovery over the last 12 weeks for all channels, particularly eating in up 88% year on year, which is very positive considering that we're con comparing back to a period last year where we had the Eat Out to Help Out scheme. Um, however, in comparison, uh, 2019 levels, it's only takeaways which are seeing growth. So um, it's fair to say the food service market is still in the process of recovery. COVID changes to our daily life has also impacted the type of meals that we eat out of home. Main meals have huge, grown hugely in importance um, while we scale back on quicker meals on snacks as we're eating less on our commutes or at lunch breaks. Shoppers are spending more on these main meals due to price rises um, but they're also treating themselves after not eating for, um, out for so long. On average, the amount that we spend per main meal has increased by 22%. This change in focus to more main meals has benefited pizza and Asian dishes, um, but coffee and sandwiches have lost share. To boost hot drinks, we need to consider advertising or promotions um, to boost uh, within the growing food service occasions, such as lunchtime deliveries and drive throughs as we have seen, we are still not back to 2019 levels as some consumers remain hesitant to eat out. From our consumer tracker in August, over a third of people say they are eating out less. Staying in more and saving money are the main reasons that people are looking to continue to restrict how often that they eat out. I'll now hand over to Susie as she runs through some of our specifics for dairy categories. Thanks very much, Grace. Um, as, as Grace mentioned, I'm going to take a look at um, a few of the dairy categories and then and then Grace is going to come back in and talk through um, some of the other ones. So we're going to start off with um, with milk and also look um, at the impact on alternatives as well. Um, and the story for milk really um, echoes what we've seen for um, total dairy. 
um, in that we saw strong growth kind of coming through um, the course of the pandemic um, and then coming into some some slight um, slight declines um, in recent in recent months. So the pre-pandemic stories was one of slight decline for liquid milk, uh, whilst we were seeing more growth in cheese and other processed products. And that was really due to loss of relevance um, and changes in host food consumption. So particularly a decline in, in hot drinks and COVID really saw a transformation there. Uh, with a return to growth as we stayed home more and drank more of those hot drinks. Um, in the last 12 week period, we're annualising against 2020, although summer, summer 2020 was a little bit more normal than say spring. Um, and so therefore we see a softening of, of performance. Overall household penetration remains fairly stable with a loss of, of less than 1%. Um, that overall volume growth that we've seen in the last 52 weekends is is really generated by host foods and as i mentioned milk as a category is very reliant on hosts and actually it's fairly unusual that people just drink milk as a drink only 2.4 billion occasions um that was in growth that occasion but actually the biggest growth um in in terms of overall number of occasions has been um milk in tea milk in coffee so it's that that hot drinks um, makes of about three quarters of, um, of milk occasions and is really important for the category. Um, so if we look at um, what's happened to dairy alternatives across the year, dairy alternatives have been growing faster than real dairy. Um, so even in the last 12 weeks where we've seen a, a, a bit of a slowdown from, from real dairy and for real milk, uh, we're still seeing growth for those alternatives, even against um, kind of the heights of 2020. And that's been a bit of an acceleration as well um, in performance, which is different to what we've actually seen from meat alternatives. And there's been a lot of talk about growth of veganism, growth of alternatives. Actually, meat alternatives saw a bit of a slowdown um, through 2020, still much, very much in growth, but a, a sort of softening of performance, whereas actually dairy alternatives um, picked up um, to, a, to a strong extent. However, we need not get too excited about it. The share of alternatives overall um, still remains at quite a low level compared to the cow's milk market. So alternatives at 5.6% by volume, 10.6% by value. Um, and in share terms, they're kind of gaining about one percentage point uh, per year. But it's important to note when you look at alternatives that it's very much being driven by a dominant force and a dominant variant. Um, very much driven by oat milk performance. Um, and actually some of the other variants are struggling to some extent, um, particularly things like nut milk as some of those environmental uh, challenges emerge. Um, and I think oats are doing particularly well due to the sustainability story that, that they're telling consumers. Um, and they also um, promote themselves on offering a bit more of a neutral flavor profile than some alternatives. Um, and I think they've worked quite heavily on um, but, you know, performance in hot drinks and kind of how they can froth, etc. Um, and I think most people will be aware as well, Oatly, for example, have invested very heavily in advertising as well. So the growth is, is largely coming through Oat. Um, interesting to note, however, um, and I think a lot of people will have seen there were some headlines recently um, in the, in the news that a, a lot of people were buying into um, the alternative category that I think one in three households were buying into the alternative category. And actually, if we look at household penetration, that is the number of households who have bought an alternative in the last four weeks specifically, you know, milk is a high frequency purchase. So, you know, to actually be counted as a, as a regular buyer, you would expect to be in a, a shopper's basket within the last four weeks. And it's actually, only 17% of households who have bought um, in the last in the last four, four weeks. So there's still plenty of room um, for, for, for growth there. But if you compare that against the household penetration for, for dairy milk, dairy milk is still very much the dominant force um, in 93% of, of fridges. Um, and actually, if we look at hot drinks, which we know is vital for um, with that kind of milk occasion, dairy alternatives still only find themselves in 4% of cups of tea that are consumed. Um, so, you know, that's a bit of a barometer for, for how 
how widespread those alternatives are. So moving away from alternatives then and to look at, at milk drinks. So this is looking at, at things like milkshakes or iced co coffee, protein drinks, for example. Um, milk drinks do represent a key opportunity um, for the sector. Um, it's a good area in which we can innovate and also add value to, to milk. Um, and if you look at total milk drinks, they've been seeing consistent growth uh, year on year with an acceleration um, during the last 52 week period. Um, and frequency is really the biggest driver of growth for that. So existing buyers buying more. And that really highlights the importance of impulse purchasing and also meal deals on shelf um, and including um, those sorts of, of added value milk drinks within meal deals is, is a way to secure growth. Okay, so moving away from milk then and into um, yogurt. Um, so the yogurt market worth uh, 1.7 billion pounds per annum and 685 million litres. Um, and if we look to see uh, what's happened, it's sort of a similar sort of story um, for yogurt. There was an uplift in, in yogurt's fortunes due to um, retail growth in the, in the last 52 weeks. Um, so you can see, um, Pretty, pretty strong growth, 0.63 and 0.5% in volume terms, with a bit of a slowdown in, in the last 12 week period, um, particularly in volume terms, although um, some value growth. Um, and a factor for yogurt this year is um, a loss of um, some promotions, which is impacting on volumes to some extent, although we're still seeing that value growth. Um, and you can see the, the line here look, demonstrating what's happened over the time period kind of echoes the picture for total dairy. Um, there's quite a bit of movement between different categories of yogurt. Um, so the areas which are doing particularly well um, are kids pots and kids handheld. Um, as you would expect, as um, kids have gone back to school, um, that really unlocks the, the lunchbox occasion once more. Um, we're also seeing strong growth um, in luxury as well. Um, some growth for dairy free um, and, and fat free, um, but a bit of a softening in performance for big pot plain particularly, and also for um, split pots. Um, and I should just mention, although it's starting from, from a lowish base, we've seen really strong growth for yogurt brands which have other health benefits. And by other health benefits, we mean um, not specifically cholesterol lowering, um, which have performed really, really rather strongly um, this year. Um, and part of the reason for yogurt's kind of resurgence um, in performance and, and a sort of weaker performance through the pandemic period is during that pandemic period, we saw really strong growth in enjoyment in indulgence, people wanting to kind of treat themselves um, and a bit of a drop, drop off of practicality um, and actually a bit of a drop off in health. Um, and in the last few months, that's kind of shifting again. So um, people are a bit less focused on enjoyment than they were, but there's been a resurgence of, of growth in practicality. So things like lunch boxes coming in, but also um, health as people have are coming out of the pandemic and they're starting to think about um, looking after their own health um, and perhaps getting rid of some of those um, lockdown pounds. And I think that really represents a good opportunity uh, for yogurt for, for fulfilling some of those, those health needs. Um, so looking at cream then, which is really the, the almost the flip, flip side of, of yogurt performance in that it's, it's category, which is really consumed for indulgence. Um, as opposed to health. Um, so let's look at how cream's performing. Cream, um, a, a smaller category than yogurt overall, so worth 486 million um, and 126,000 tonnes. Um, Pre-COVID, cream had come back into growth actually after um, a few years of, of decline. Um, but in the last 52 weeks, which incorporates that COVID period, you can see really, really strong levels of growth up 9.6% and by, by uh, value terms and 10.8% in volume terms. Um, in the last 12 weeks, we've kind of seen a flip and a reversal of, of fortunes. Um, as we return back to normality, um, one of the things that was really driving growth um, in that COVID period, as people were stuck at home, they were looking for indulgence, as I mentioned, but there was also a real growth in home baking. Um, as people were just looking for activities, things to do with the kids, um, 
get them through those cold, dark evenings. Um, however, you know, people have less time now as we've gone back to work and the kids have gone back to school. So, so we're seeing less of, of that happening. Um, and you can see the in the graph how um, volume change has, has, has changed over time. Um, there has been a bit of a resurgence of um, promotions in the cream category, all starting from a very low base. It's not a heavily promoted category at only 7%, but um, that has doubled since last year. Um, and as I touched upon just on the baking point, um, through 2020, uh, we did go baking crazy and you can see the massive growth in, in sweet home baking occasions. Uh, they're now coming back to normal from the peak of 77 million baking occasions that we saw every four weeks at the height of the pandemic. However, it's not all doom and gloom because um, despite quite a poor summer in terms of weather, overall cream occasions are still up versus the pre-COVID picture. Um, so over that summer period for summer 2021, um, we saw 201 million occasions, um, as, as mentioned, down since last year, so down by 15%, but still versus two years ago, um, up by 10% in terms of occasions. On the savoury side, um, looking at creme fraiche, um, creme fraiche has been a category which has performed incredibly well um, over the past couple of years. And I think creme fraiche has really benefited from the growth in scratch cooking occasions with, um, with, with creme fraiche occasions almost doubling versus 2019. And um, that's been really driven by savoury. So the majority of creme fraiche occasions are used in savoury dishes, 56%. Um, but the sorts of dishes which include creme fraiche are um, Italian, which make up over half of occasions, so very much on pasta sauces and things like that. But also British um, savoury dishes making up a quarter of occasions and also Mexican dishes um, where it could be used as an alternative to sour cream, um, for example, um, making up 13% of occasions. Um, so now I'm going to hand back over to Grace, who's going to look at cheese and yellow fats. Thanks, Susie. Yes, yeah, so as, she, as Susie said, we're just going to look at cheese next. So over the last year, um, British shoppers spent £3.5 billion pounds on cheese, um, which is three uh, 534,000 uh, tonnes. Um, if we look at the picture pre-COVID, so before the pandemic, cheese was in a very good place, seeing positive um, value and volume growth. Um, and cheese really benefited um, as being viewed as a tasty and convenient addition to meals. Um, especially by um, millennials, we saw that that was something that they were really uh, unwilling to give up and something that they um, indulged in as well. Um, and we saw a lot on social media, so that really driving that growth in, um, in cheese. And we've seen positive sales over the last year as well, boosted by the pandemic. Um, if you just go back, sorry, Susie. Um, and we, uh, we have seen a decline on the heights of uh, 2020 if we look at the last 12 weeks, um, with value down 2.2% and volumes down 2.7%. Um, if we compare this back to 2019, though, volume, uh, volumes are still up 10%. Um, so still a really positive picture for cheese um, versus two years ago. Um, when we look at the 12-week uh, volume chart on the uh, bottom there, and um, we can see that cheese uh, did peak um, in July 2020, up 22%, but that continued through um, most of the uh, of the year, um, first year of the pandemic. Um, retailers have been scaling back promotions across a lot of categories, um, and cheese was no different, so we did see a drop in the volume sold on promotion, um, down 4%. If we now look at varieties, uh, cheese varieties, uh, cheddar makes up nearly half of all cheese volumes sold in Britain. Um, so really popular um, cheddar with uh, consumers. Speciality and continental is the second biggest group with a 19% share of volumes. And this uh, is continental cheeses such as camembert and mozzarella and speciality like halloumi and paneer. Um, so if we look at which cheeses have been driving growth, um, processed cheese is up 2.1%, uh, and that's the only cheese that's seen growth year on year, whereas we've seen all other um, cheese varieties um, in decline. Um, in comparison to 2019 levels, you can see on the green bars here, um, it's been a pretty positive picture, um, with British regional cheeses such as uh, Red Leicester and Double Gloucester seeing the most growth, up 23%. Uh, 
And this growth was really driven by younger shoppers switching away from cheddar to more regional cheeses. Um, and this has really been a positive for overall value for cheese. Um, and consumers are trading up and willing to pay more for these speciality and regional cheeses. Um, so if you just click on Susie one, should bring up. So there you go, the average price there um, for uh, the regionals and speciality and continental being um, higher than cheddar. Um, so there is still an opportunity to um, encourage shoppers to trade up into more expensive and premium cheeses um, as shoppers are still treating themselves with food. And we can see this in the sales as um, premium private label cheeses are still seeing growth year on year, whereas um, budget and private, la uh, budget private label and branded uh, cheeses are seeing decline. Um, as uh, we mentioned earlier, lunchboxes are starting to recover well. So encouraging snacking uh, and lunchbox cheeses with young families could be an opportunity to stretch dairy at the lunchtime occasion and diversify away from just your standard cheese sandwich. When we look at cooking at home, um, all uh, cheeses and all types of dishes are seeing growth in the first year of the pandemic, uh, with cheese on toast being the fastest growing way that people are consuming cheese, up 19% year on year. Uh, dishes is the most common way that consumers use cheese, and there are an additional uh, 335 million uh, cheesy meals. Uh, lunch is the biggest occasion for cheese, with a 42% share of cheese occasions. Uh, cheese sandwiches have always been very popular, but as we spend more time at home, we do see that growth in hot lunches come through um, during the pandemic, and cheese on toast fits really well with this, um, with this trend. Um, and as it's likely that many of us will continue to work flexibly, splitting our time between working at home and working in the office, I think there is an opportunity here to continue to remind consumers how quick and tasty something like cheese on toast or a baked potato with cheese can be. Um, for evening meals, pasta is the most popular dish um, to be had with cheese. Um, and adding cheese on top of a range of foods is really easy and cheap way to add extra flavour. So it could be an opportunity if shoppers do start to worry about budgets. Um, cheese can really capitalise on this um, as being a really cheap and tasty way to add flavour. If we look now at the out of home market, um, burgers and pizzas are very popular dishes um, which might contain cheese. Um, we've seen a, a really positive uh, performance for them over the last year and the last 12 weeks. Um, other Italians, such as pasta and risotto and cheese sandwiches and cheese salads are much smaller in terms of meal occasions out of home. And if we look at the year on year change, pasta and sandwiches um, have really been the most impacted by those restrictions. So um, pasta and risotto is down 26% um, and cheese sandwiches down 6% over the last year as these are more reliant on those dining in or on the go, grabbing a meal deal um, sort of occasions, and which is what has been really restricted over the last year of the pandemic. Whereas pizzas and burgers have really been boosted, and this is through growth in takeaways, both really um, playing on that takeaway market, so seeing really positive growth over the last year. But with the reopening of restaurants, we do see uh, Italian and cheese salads making a strong recovery in the last 12 weeks, both doubling the number of occasions on 2020 levels, both up over 100%. We now look at the yellow fats. So over the last year, British shoppers spent £1.6 billion on butter, spreads and margarines, which is the equivalent of 4,000 tonnes, 400,000 tonnes. Uh, so before the pandemic, um, we saw that yellow fats were in volume growth, but in value decline. And this was because shoppers were um, buying into cheaper products. Um, over the last year of the pandemic, yellow fats have seen um, a volume decline. And in the last 12 weeks, we've also seen a value decline by 4.9% and volume decline by 5.7%. Um, and this decline that we've seen in volumes over the last year was because yellow fats were really boosted by that baking boom at the very start of the pandemic. And we see that they were up 26% at their peak in July 2020 on that rolling chart. Um, but they have failed to keep up the momentum in the same way that other dairy products have. And um, so we do actually see when we compare back this year to last year, um, that baking boom right at the very start of the pandemic meant that we've seen a uh, volumes decline uh, for this year. However, when we compare back the last 12 weeks to 2019, we saw the volumes are still elevated um, with uh, volumes up 5%. Uh, in terms of shoppers, the retired households um, are one of the uh, biggest uh, groups of uh, shoppers for uh, yellow fats, and they were the only group to see an increase in the amount of yellow fats they bought over the last year. So this is really a growing group um, for this category, um, up 
1.8%. Within yellow fats, um, purely dairy block butter makes up 21% of volumes. Um, spreadable butter here, which uh, may contain milk, but also vegetable fats um, and margarine, take the lion's share at 76%. Uh, then specifically labelled plant-based spreads make up only 3% of the market. In the uh, 12 weeks of the 5th of September, plant-based spreads were the only ones to see growth year on year, um, but it was not enough to make up for the losses in block butter and spreads. Um, this growth was really driven by new shoppers, so lots of new shoppers entering um, the plant-based fats market, um, and there uh, was a growth of 31% year on year. In comparison to 2019, all areas were in growth, um, but spreads and margarine were the slowest growing, and this was because we have seen price increases for spreads and margarines year on year, while we've seen um, decreases in block butter and sunflower. Um, and this might be due to a scaling back of promotions on spreads and margarines. So as you can see here, um, the, uh, the promotions were down eight percentage points um, on the, in the last 12 weeks, where we've seen growth in promotions for both block butter and um, sunflower and plant-based over the last 12 weeks. Um, for yellow fats, shoppers are very price aware. Um, so they do often switch their shopping habits depending on what is on promotion or what the prices are when they get to the shelves. So making sure that we get the right strategy um, in terms of price and promotions is really important for yellow fats. So how do consume, uh, consumers use yellow fats once they get them in home? Um, so 72% of occasions are used in spreading, so on sandwiches or toast. Uh, and there were an additional 727 million uses of yellow fats for spreading over the last year to May 2021. Uh, but using uh, yellow fats as a topping was the fastest use um, over the last year at 21%, which is really boosted by those um, in-home hot lunches that we've been seeing, so things like baked potatoes. Uh, lunch and breakfast are both very important to yellow fats, uh, with 35% of uses happening at lunch and also 35% at breakfast. Uh, block butter, um, which is made with 100% cow's milk, is something that consumers really do understand. Um, and block butter is 34% more likely to be chosen because it's natural in comparison to other yellow fats. And so playing on this naturalness of butter in messaging, in communications with consumers could really boost sales for shoppers, especially if we've seen that um, interest in a return to health after that pandemic slump. So if I hand back now to Susie, he's going to discuss the future and opportunities. Thanks very much, Grace. Um, so a bit of a whistle stop tour through um, all of the dairy categories there. Um, but hopefully uh, you can see it's bit, there's been um, quite a bit of change in the market. Um, lots of lots of dynamism, but also lots of opportunities. So looking forward then. What do we expect to happen over the coming months? Well, AHDB publish an agri-market outlook every six months, which looks ahead at retail performance and expectations for all meat and dairy products in the short to medium term. Um, so looking at that forecast, which really takes into account both societal and economic factors, such as increased working from home and the re reticence to eat out because due to due to worries about COVID and also growth in, in inflation, for example, um, to see what might happen. Um, and this picture shows that although we see a, a slight decline in, in retail versus 2020, um, still really considerable growth um, since 2019. So up particularly for cheese and butter, up, up in double digits, up by 13% for cheese, up by 16% for butter, um, more modest growth for, for milk and yogurt. So looking forward to next year versus this year, this is the line in navy at the bottom, uh, we expect a bit more return to normality um, in terms of more office working um, and growth in food service, which would see some degree of decline in retail versus this year. I think it's really important to note this is a movable feast, however, um, as we know, um, you know, the, the picture is we're relatively gloomy at the moment in terms of pressure on the NHS. Um, some noises about about potentially return to working from home, but hopefully um, not not just yet. But that could very much affect things um, as we go. And I think it's also true to say that. Um, we're starting to see people starting to look at their dairy consumption again. Um, so. 
certainly pre-COVID, it was it was something that was kind of in quite strong growth. People saying that they wanted to um, start cutting back on their dairy consumption. During the COVID period, we saw a real drop off actually in, in that and people returned to eating real dairy um, and just not wanting to moderate their consumption in the same way. Um, but we're, we're starting to see that, that reduction um, coming back in um, or claim reduction. So that's up by 4% since 2020. Um, and, and that's really been driven by um, the usual suspects. So um, particularly Londoners, um, younger consumers, so 18 to 24 year olds, 25 to 34 year olds particularly, um, and readers of The Guardian. Um, and what's really driving that are concerns around, um, around health, around um, the environment, and also around um, animal welfare. Um, and I think both in retail and food services, a real opportunity um, in both health and, and sustainability. So we know that health is something that's very important to consumers. So seven in 10 consumers claim that they try and lead a healthy lifestyle. Um, and also sustainability is becoming increasingly high on everybody's radar, um, particularly right now with COP26 going on, um, there's heightened awareness of all the kind of issues. Um, and 40% state that the, the impact on the environment is extremely or very important in the product choices that they make. So it's going to be something which will be very much front and center of, of people's minds. We are going to cover this topic, um, not just for dairy, but for, for meat as well, um, but in a lot more depth in our next consumer landscape webinar, which is happening on Thursday, the 25th of November um, at 10 o'clock. So if you haven't signed up already, then please, please do so. Um, the links will be um, on our website um, and I think they'll probably be sent out when we send the slides out as well for this. Um, so real opportunity there, but please do come and find out more. So just really to summarize some of, some of the issues and some of the things that we expect to see coming down the line, um hfs hfss high fat sugar salt regulations coming in on, on october next year um will represent a challenge and will place limits on volume promotions such as multi buys and buy one get one free type promotions for products deemed to be in scope of the high fat salt or sugar regulations um, now we know that yogurt and butter are the most reliant of our categories on promotions um, and yogurt and added sugar milk drinks are the only full dairy products currently within scope. So um, we're thinking about how we kind of get around that. Um, you know, is there an opportunity to continue to switch to everyday low pricing or use approved promotional, promotional methods such as temporary price reductions, for example? Um, also a need for reinvigorate. And I think this has been a, a perennial um, a factor in in the dairy market um you know the many dairy products are, are heavily commoditized particularly liquid milk so there's a real need to counter that commoditization with innovation i think that's new news um but there are very much emerging need states of health and wellness coming through um you know needs for gut health high protein lower fat for example um, without sacrificing flavour and indulgence. And I think there's this real tension here. People want a healthier product, but they also don't want to have to compromise on flavour. So there's opportunity um, there, and particularly in some of the newer categories, such as kefir, for example, which can um, offer a lot of gut health benefits. Um, oh, don't know what's happened with my bills there. Um, Defend is another one, so, and, and it sort of links to industry image, so I'll cover them both together. Um, the the reputation of dairy on health environment and animal welfare are really under attack and we will cover that more in the next webinar um and but at the same time there's this whole plethora of entrance to plant to the plant-based alternative market um so there's two jobs to be done one is around innovation again but ensuring that that innovation in real dairy keeps pace with alternatives in terms of occasions and need states because there is a real need to defend our share of shelf space um, and then also there is also a real need to promote the positives of consuming dairy in terms of health um, and, you know, reassure consumers around environment and around animal welfare. Um, and we're doing some of that as part of our Eat Balance campaign, which we will talk more about um, in the consumer landscape webinar as well. Um, but, but, but watch the space for that. Um, so finally then just to sum up the next webinar is um on the 25th of november at 10 a.m so please do um sign up
Um, and I'm just going to hand back to Kim, who is going to go with Q&A. Thank you very much um, to Susie, to Grace for that great presentation. Um, it's a lot to cover all of those dairy categories um, in such a sport, short space of time, um, but great insights for, for the industry. And if anyone wants any more in-depth information, um, because as Susie said, it was quite a whistle-stop tour, then please get uh, in contact um, with the team. So before moving on to a QA, and a um, Susie's already reminded you, please sign up to the, to the last of our webinars on the 25th of November. Um, the webinar sign up is available on our website, but also on our website, you can sign up to our bi-monthly newsletter, which informs you of what articles and reports have been released in the recent weeks. Um, and last reminder is to fill in the feedback form at the end if you would like a copy of the slides. Um, and we also really appreciate hearing your thoughts as well. So let's move on to um, some questions. And just to flag, if we don't cover everything, we, we can answer them via um, email. Um, so please get the, the questions coming in. Um, I've got a couple that have come in um, while you've been talking. Um, the first one I'll probably hand over to, to Grace because it's specific um, about cheese. So could you give any more detail about cheese variety performance, um, particularly versus, versus pre-COVID? Uh, yes, so we saw on the slide that um, regionals and speciality and continental were doing particularly well versus 2019 levels. Um, so for regional, um, Red Leicester is the biggest uh, cheese within that category um, and Red Leicester is driving most of the growth that we are seeing in terms of volumes. Um, within Speciality and Continental, Mozzarella is um, one of the bigger ones um, and that's contributing the most to volumes. Um, but Paneer is actually the fastest growing. Uh, so I think that that shows that uh, there is an opportunity to encourage consumers to sort of use cheese such as like paneer is like a main component in their main meal. And so really seeing those sort of more main mealy um, types of cheese do really well, especially um, as they're quite reasonably priced in comparison to what could be a center of a, of a dish like meat or a meat alternative. Great, thank you, Grace. Um, I think this is probably going to be covered a, a, a lot in the in the next web, webinar, which Susie, you've already mentioned. But Susie, what do you think are the, the main drivers of people reassessing their, their dairy consumption? Um, there's a couple of strands of thought here. So there's um, there's what people say they're doing, um, um, which, which is why they claim to be reducing. So so I, I talked about some of those factors before and we're going to talk about them much more in the next webinar. But um health health is one that's kind of always been in in the background um and that is is particularly impactful for people on their kind of personal basis whether they have food intolerances or they just kind of want to be healthier um the other things that that people talk about are environment um and that's really come up the rank order so even five years ago hardly anybody talked about environment regarding dairy and now that's kind of shot up um, so there are kind of questions being asked around the roles of, you know, cows and methane, etc. Um, so that's something that people are thinking about and also thinking about animal welfare. Now, we have on, on the other side of things, we have done some research looking at people who've actually genuinely changed their dairy consumption. So, so we've looked at panel data and we've looked at people who have actually dropped off um, and changed year on year. And then we've kind of looked to see what are some of the things that are driving those that group and it's actually not necessarily the same things that people talk about um people talk there about kind of more of a, a, a loss of relevance or a change in in host foods um so there's a real need there to also remind people about enjoyment and why they really value um the place of you know cheese in their life for example and grace talk, talked about millennials we know that Millennials absolutely love cheese and um, it you know plays a big role and you really got to look at Instagram and look at hashtag cheese to see um, to see what's coming on there. So I think those are some of the factors. Um, they've, they've got different routes of addressing that issue, um, but we need to kind of address all of those factors together. So both the relevance issue and the innovation issue, but then also um, you know some of those reputational factors. Great, thank you very much, Susie. 
Um, so there's a couple of questions about um, alternatives. Um, so the first one um, is uh, is about milk. So Susie, I might hand back that to you, but Grace, feel free to to shout up if you have anything um, to add. Um, the first one is about um, do we have a split of brands versus own label in alternative mi milks? So basically, it seems like brands are driving growth in the category with little or no advertising. To, so Susie, do you do you know much about the milk alternatives brand versus own label? Um, it's not something that we've kind of dug into specifically, but I think that's something we can look at. And that, uh, the the alternatives market is very heavily branded, although retailers are now picking up kind of their own offerings as usually as usually would happen. So there's been a, quite a bit of growth in in a label, um, but brands are certainly driving that, and particularly with the advertising um, activity which has been going on, um, and and Oatly driving driving a lot of that growth specifically. Great, thank you. We'll have a look um, if there's any other follow-ups we can add to that and um, yeah. can email that um, attendee directly. Perfect. Um, there is also a comment about potato milk, which I know that we wouldn't have any um, data on, um, but it is claimed that it's going to be the next next big thing. I suppose with these kind of next big things, do we think um, that they're kind of like artificially manufactured trends or do we really see potential with these having market growth? Um, I, th I think within the alternatives market, especially, I think there's a lot of openness to new things. I mean, and that's why people go for alternatives in the first place. It's kind of a shiny new thing, which is a bit different to, you know, the tr you know our traditional milk, which is all just in massive bottles and a bit, you know, a bit boring, let's be honest. Um, so I think there's, there's opportunity. I don't know whether there may be some consumer barriers around perceived taste i don't know if potatoes and milk um but you know it's a great opportunity for the for the potato sector if it takes off so i'm not gonna i'm not gonna do it down but i think it's called doug isn't it the, the potato milk brand which is which is being launched which is is quite clever uh, so it'd be interesting to see um but i think we've also seen you know other 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 milks coming into the market like pea and hemp which have maybe struggled to gain the same amount of traction as perhaps oat has. Um, and again, that might be to do with taste barriers, for example, or um, perceptions of versatility. Not all milks perform equally well um, in tea. And I think nothing works quite as well as dairy milk in a cup of tea. So, you know, there's a lot of issues around splitting and things like that. So uh, yeah, but it'd be interesting to see. And there's um, another question linked to milk as, as well. Um, have we got any um, performance information about UHT uh, milk? Again, not something we looked at. The last time I looked at UHT, though, it was quite a lot of strong growth in 2020, um, purely because people were trying to minimise the amount of trips they made out to the shops and, you know, fears that you know, if they were in self-isolation, it's just good to have a couple of packs of UHT milk around. Um, so certainly last year was still in growth. I haven't actually looked at it in the in the last uh, in the last few months. But again, we can follow up on that. Great, thank you very much. I think that's all um, the the questions we've got from the attendees currently. Um, so we can get back to to the certain attendees that wanted a bit more detail. But again. Um, as mentioned, this was quite a whistle-stop tour because there's a lot of uh, dairy categories to cover. So please just feel free to contact the, the team if you have any further questions or want to deeper dive into anything else. So, so we'll probably close there and give everyone 10 minutes of their life back before, before their next meeting. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you very much to, to Grace and Susie for, for pulling that presentation together today. And also thank you very much to all the attendees for attending. And please fill in the, the feedback form, which will will pop up at the end um, to make sure that you get a copy of these slides. So thank you very much.